Okay, my friends, it's Roger once again looking at CERN's pictures of their Higgs bosons where particles crash and spew out particles, a bazillions of them all over. Why do they have so many particles? Let me show you what we did. All right, CERN has a bazillion particles because they're working with heavy particles. They're working with protons, which have a lot of particles in them. In my world, they have 1,836 particles per proton, which they have approximately, I believe they're working with four protons, which would give them 8,000 particles. I have one particle or two coming from photons, which are the snowflakes. They are using the snowballs. I am using the snowflakes. And that snowflake spun backwards when it came through the accelerator. And yes, light can be accelerated. And yes, that's Cheryankov. And yes, that's the boson filaments that are spinning faster than they should for this, this atmosphere. And they are not interacting until they fluff up in these fields because they are charged particles carrying fields. They're charged particle carriers, which are bosons. These are Higgs fields which follow the charged particle as it spins creating those magnetic polar fields. Now I have a video that supports this. It's up here on YouTube and uh, it shows what I'm saying is the nuclear particles. Now I'm going to read you the paper and then you can go up here and look at this. I show you know all of our different research and how they interact. It's only four minutes and it's very simple. That's because the only way you can make a theory that works is simplicity. What we have now is ridiculous. All right, I'm just going to read it. It's only going to take a few minutes. Electron flood theory. It's been said that for a new theory to be accepted that it must be true, revolutionary, and must be simple and I agree and here it is. Now, why is it such a drastic new way of conceptualizing the nucleus? Because it's totally different. Well, that's because physics is unworkable with the Bohr model. It's totally un unworkable. Isotopes, even hydrogens, are impossible to account for with it. There's, no, there's so much strong and weak, spooky, charm, dark love, it could be a romance novel. Now, electron flood theory claims there are only two particles that exist which are both approximately 0.000545 atomic mass units and have equal and opposite charges of one electron volt, positive, negative, up and down. Which, I'm going to go on to say the nucleus is a mass of these small positive and negative particles attached together tightly like, mag like a magnetic ball of particles very similar to this okay now electron flood atomic model says that the snowball particles are protons and neutrons in here and then electrons are snowflakes now there's 1,836 particles in every single proton. 918 are positive, 918 negative. Every single proton. And in every single neutron, there's 1837, which is 918 positive, 919 negative. An additional negative, and that becomes a weak force. So the strong force is simply solid magnetism. This is 1836. The weak force is this. 1837, one sticking off the side somewhere that it's not held tightly. It's simple, and it dis disassociates e easily. That's a weak force. Atomic elements are masses of particles that are stable due to resonance frequencies of the particle interactions. There's something to do with them that they have... They have to sit together at a certain way. They're all moving, but they have to hit a certain number of them. I call it the resonance quantity, not the resonance frequency, the resonance quantity. All right, so the 1836 protons, 1837 neutrons, resonance frequency of a particle interaction assumed as stability. Isotopes are observed when they have the extra things and not enough, okay? So, 
electrons reside in orbitals in exact distances dictated by the nuclear surface topography. If we've got a ton of extra electrons here, and that happens in isotopes, you're going to have a different sort of topography on the outside because the, the electrons that are in the orbitals are trying to get in, but they're held away by the excess electrons here. There's always excess. There's never less electrons in the core than there is positrons. They're exactly the same, only there's always, always, always excess electrons. And they say there's always excess neutrons. All right, so now we get down to that we understand the distances from the or the, the, that are in the orbitals, and the first layer of orbitals will dictate where the second layer sits, and the second layer will dictate the third layer. Simple as that. Now, what is the source of isotopes? I talked about isotopes having extra little particles and so forth, or not enough particles. The electron-coated nuclear surface, totally coated with electrons on the outside, just extra electrons. So the electron-coated nuclear surface is the source of isotopes. They got extra ones or not enough on here to really give it that coating. All right. So the nuclear surface source of isotopes, the nuclei with extra or less than the exact resonance quantity. So there should be, let's say, 1,836. There's 1,850. You've got 14 of them in here that are floating around and sort of not real stable, like the 1,836. The 1,836 is never going to break. But you throw some more in there, they are going to float away eventually. That's what's called nuclear decay, and that's why they say 10 years down the road, this one's going to decay. 20 years down the road, that one's going to, that type of thing. No. So, the exact resonant frequencies are stable nuclei. The ones with excess are not enough particles for resonance, are reactive, and decay. They're not stable. So, then we get down to free electrons. What's a free electron? Free electrons are static electricity. It's just floating in the air. Well, how's it floating in the air? Free. It's attached primarily to water molecules that are in the air just floating around. We know there's moisture all over. And is the moving electrons in circuits. In, the, uh, in, in circuits, those electricity is moving. It's not just bing, 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 like a big perturbation. They are literally moving down that line. And those are the electrons in circuits, and it's also in light, in solar cells. They, you, the light smashes into solar cells and makes it electricity. What? How, how hard is that to understand? It is the ether. Always talked about the ether. That is the ether, and it exists, and it is seen in my experiments, glowing little particles. Now, so now we get to the snowball nucleus. That's what I'm saying. The nucleus is a snowball. There's not just certain electrons, I mean, uh, protons and neutrons in there, just a whole batch of particles. And they form as tightly as they can into atomic elements. And the elements are simply chunks of resonance quantities. At a 100, it's stable. At 300, it's stable. At 628, it's stable. That type of thing. They will be exact, stable frequencies or, or quantities. Now, so that's your snowball nucleus. It's simply a crush, a huge number of magnetic particles crushed together. Some extra ones sneak in, sometimes there's not enough. That's your isotope. Now, what does that do? Electron flood accounts for every single material interaction, every single thing. I can account for every single one we see, and the isotopes, and every inner energy interaction, from lightning to static to sprites to Steve's as new discharges into space to the magnetic poles and fields to uh, outer space and how everything goes, goes on out there and how the particles interact and how they don't interact because they have plenty of room for the regions that they occupy. Now, so, it accounts for everything, and then not only that, it accounts for simple friction, for heat, bio and sonoluminescence, sprites, lightning, static, and e even gravity and dark matter. Well, what's gravity? Gravity is simply electronic attraction. Electrons are pulled to Earth. Well, here it is. The Earth is positive. It's a positive, attractive source. 
it attracts all negatives like electricity, static, lightning, boop, right to ground because it is attractive. Now, gravity is simply magnetic pull of extra electrons. So you have a mass of positives, have a mass of negatives, they're all bound together, and there's a few extra negatives. All right. If there's enough extra negatives, it hits the ground. However, hydrogen and helium don't have enough extra electrons. They're not magnetic enough to, to, to come to the ground. They float up. They are anti-gravity. That's what it is. If we can make things positive in relation to the Earth, they would go up and they would not come down. Because you always have a ton of extra negatives. And as you hit lithium and you start going up, they get heavier and heavier and heavier and they fall harder and harder and harder. Simple as that. Now, what do we have left? Dark energy and dark matter is simply light. <laughs> How ironic is that? It's in space coming to us from the sun. Obviously it's particles and they're coming to us. They smash into the atmosphere and cause all kinds of heat and create extra electrons, all this stuff. It's quite obvious. So the Earth pulls all these things down. The dark energy is the light that's being pulled to Earth and it's seen in the experience. I've shown the, the, the the particles and they are particles so they are particles so they're coming to us as particles they're not then they have a mass they have a mass all right as they travel from the source like the sun through space and do not interact until they hit dense molecules you don't see them they're dark they're dark you don't see them but when they smash into something they light it up they heat it up all right so that's your dark energy and dark matter now so what else do we have light can accelerate I've shown it accelerate in my experiments. Therefore, we cannot be certain of where we are because Hubble and Einstein said light is always traveling forever at the exact same speed. It's just simply wrong. So, what Hubble said was everything's got to be moving away from us because light never slows down. Well, that's wrong. So, where are we? <laughs> we don't know. Hubble and Einstein said light traveling's that forever at the exact same speed, it is wrong. Redshift is simply light slowing down. Not that the planets are going away and everything's going away. Now it's going away faster than it can possibly go, which is the speed of light because it's we can see so far away now. So it's, it really doesn't work in any any realm whatsoever. So light is simply slowing down. That's the redshift. So what does that mean? That means it's due to ver can it can be due to variations in density because whatever is holding it back is magnetically pulling it back so it's going to be stretched and you're going to see red shift however the, the it, it pulls it from its source therefore a close dense neighbor will appear to be extremely far away and an extremely far away not dense neighbor will appear to be not extremely far away we have no idea where we are. Now, finishing up, CERN uses 8,000 times heavier particles than I do, but the patterns of final particles are identical because they simply had a bigger snowball. I used this, they used that. My particles come together this way through a venturi, theirs come together this way head on. No difference whatsoever. Same, same, same. The light particle accelerator was from Rod Warren, and he did uh, the pictures that I show. And the atomic theory is uh, on my side of it. All right, thank you. And I, I want, I want a peer review on this. No one will publish it. No one will respond. No one will talk to me because I'm not part of their, their clique. So I want somebody to say, well, let's take a look at it. That's all I'm asking. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay, I, I don't have the means to do the research that's required to be seen. They won't even allow it to be seen so that nobody else has the opportunity to do this research. I need somebody to do the things I'm asking to do. See if they can create fusion using that Venturi, crushing these particles together. It may be possible, but nobody will ever know. Because nobody will ever look. I need somebody to look at it and see. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. Thank you.